Hello and welcome to Intertech's Oxygen Blast series. My name is Jason Shapiro and I'm going to be talking to you today about globalizing your Java application. So before we jump into the subject matter, just to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Jason Shapiro. I have around 15 years of professional software development and architecture experience, um, mainly working in these latter years uh, with business intelligence software and portal applications. Hold a Master of Science in Software Engineering and a couple of certifications including uh, Certified Java Programmer and Web Component Developer. If you have any interest in uh, following some of the projects that I'm working on and uh, technologies that I'm interested in, you can uh, subscribe to my blog by going to decoupledmusings.blogspot.com. So for the topic today, we're going to be talking about Java and how you're able to globalize your software. So to start with, we'll speak about the definitions and terms. What does it mean to say globalizing your software? What is internationalization and how does that differ from localization? Once we have some of the terms now, we'll talk about the different stages that you'll go through in your project, starting with internationalization, which is really where the bulk of your work is going to take place, uh, followed by localization and testing. So as we look at internationalization, I'll define things such as what is a locale, what type of content should you be internationalizing, what are resource bundles and how do they assist in the internationalization process. We'll talk about sorting and searching briefly and through that we'll use collators. And some GUI considerations, what do you have to think about when you're laying out your screen in terms of how it may look differently when other languages um, are used in your application speak a little bit about character encoding and some third-party tools that are available. Then we'll move on to localization. Uh, we'll talk about some things that you can do to better prepare yourself when submitting resource bundles to translation companies. Now a translation company may be internal to your organization. A lot of times they're external. Um, so I'll define what that process is and some ways that you can mitigate problems that happen uh, frequently in projects. We'll also talk about words versus context and some localized testing. If you want to get a copy of the slides that I have for this presentation, you can do so by going to www.intertech.com slash downloads slash o2-i18n.pptx. So let's begin with uh, some definition of terms, starting with globalization. It's in the name of the presentation. What exactly does that mean? Well, globalization in the context of software denotes that an application has been both internationalized and localized. All right, well, it kind of moves us in the right direction. What does it mean to be internationalized and what does it mean to be localized? Internationalization is really just the process of looking at your application, finding all of the hard-coded regional specific information such as text that's in English, maybe that needs to be also in French, uh, maybe date formats, uh, time formats, currency, images that have locale or regional specific meaning. We find all of these uh, pieces of content and we pull them out. We pull them out of our application and then we delegate. We start to use other APIs and libraries that will look up the content we need to have in our application, typically at runtime, and we'll make a decision based on a locale object that we pass in. Now we'll talk about locales in just a little bit, but the, the main, main important um, uh, concept here is that we're really just pulling out all of this hard-coded regional specific information, pulling it out of the application and then using other libraries to look up the right locale specific regional information um, at the time the application is running. So often when you see internationalization you'll see it abbreviated by as I18N uh, and the reason is pretty simple. There's 18 letters in between the first I and the final N in the word internationalization. Uh, localization. So that's the second part. If internationalization is the process of pulling all this regional specific information out of our application, localization is really just the process of um, creating bundles of these of this content that we can then look up at runtime and uh, display in our application. So I could have an application that's internationalized, that's ready to be localized, and then when I go through the localization process, what I do is I'd have an English resource bundle um, that has text, images, things like that. I may have a French uh, bundle, uh, a bundle in Hindi, 
Um, and uh, again, at runtime, as I'm starting to, uh, as someone's starting to use the application, um, the application figures out what locale are they from and tries to find the appropriate resource bundle to display regional specific content. So when we internationalize uh, our application and then we go through the localization process of having different resource bundles available to choose from at runtime, those concepts together um, are called globalization. Whenever we develop software, we apply some sort of a life cycle to that development process. And there's lots of different methodologies that help uh, you know, make suggestions of what that life cycle should be. Everything from a traditional waterfall uh, methodology through a more modern uh, agile software development methodology. Whatever you choose, um, when you're doing a project that's going to uh, require globalization, you're going to want to incorporate um, three different stages into that life cycle. Now, their actual placement is up to you and with whatever methodology you're using, but these three uh, need to take um, need to occur during your development. So the first is internationalization. Uh, the bulk of this particular presentation is going to be talking about what it means to go through the stage. But right now we're just talking about the placement. And really, my suggestion is your internationalization should happen as the same time as your development, the same time that you're coding. Internationalization should not be an afterthought, um, something you do to the application after it's all been completed. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not always possible. Sometimes we've created a an application and the requirement comes that we have to support different regions um, late in the game so sometimes that that, that can't be avoided uh, but what you really should do especially after seeing this presentation is uh, try to make a conscious effort to do your internationalization right at the time you're coding it's completely possible to internationalize your application and have it localized for only a single language. It just enables a lot of flexibility should any of these requirements come in the future. And it really doesn't take too much extra time in terms of planning, uh, design, and coding. Second thing you're going to do is there's going to be some sort of a handoff stage, whether it's internal to your company or external, uh, some service that you use, some third-party service. You're going to want to work with someone who can do the translations. So they're going to want to translate the text. They're going to want to maybe come up with regional specific images. And what you're going to do is you're going to need to uh, create some sort of documentation for these translation services. A lot of the services will just say, sure, give me the text and I'll translate it for you. Uh, I'm going to talk about some other things that you may want to give them that will help them and ensure that the translations that come back are the best possible translations. And finally, at some point, you'll want to do localized testing, localization testing. Uh, this, is, uh, this can fall typically at the end of the project. Now, that's not to say that you're not working with iterations and this testing doesn't happen several times, but the idea is that it's localization testing is when we receive back from the translation services these localized bundles. And we're not really testing the application for functional um, uh, functional verification, which we're, which we're doing with our unit testing and whatnot. Um, instead, we're really looking for things like, you know, is the text showing up as French when it should be French and German when it should be German? Um, are the words that we used, do they make sense? Now, the translation of the words may be correct, but in the context of what they're being used, does that make sense? So this should already give you a hint that during the stage, you're going to need someone who's very familiar with the language or the region to be able to uh, ensure that this, uh, the, the context of the words is, is valid. Um, you're also going to want to do some GUI testing at this point. There are words that can grow much, much bigger depending in uh, depending on what language that they're being uh, localized to. Or conversely, they could get smaller. Now, that could potentially um, offset your, your graphical user interface. So those are the kinds of things that you're going to want to do during the testing. We'll talk about more of these stages uh, during this presentation. But right now, these are the three stages that you're going to want to incorporate into your existing software development methodology. So let's just jump into the topic of internationalization, which is really what you're going to spend most of your time doing when you're globalizing your software. So what do you do when you're internationalizing your uh, uh, application? You identify content that should change depending on a user's region. We'll talk about that content and different ways that you can pull it out in a few minutes. Uh, but once you've identified that content, you want to remove it from the application so that it's no longer hard-coded. 
and place them into external resources. These uh, become known as resource bundles. Once the content has been um, externalized, um, you can use API methods uh, through either libraries provided by Java, right out of the box, or third-party utilities. And we use these uh, methods, these objects, to delegate the lookup and rendering of this content. Um, so it doesn't happen until runtime. At that point, we are able to dynamically switch between different languages or regions. Now, internationalization does not mean that your application supports more than one region. If I say my application is internationalized, that doesn't mean it's going to automatically work with um, French or German or Hindi or whatever language or uh, region I want to uh, uh, work with. It just means that all the hard-coded regional information has been extracted. Um, so now if I need to support another locale, another region, uh, support another language, then I'm not going to have to make any changes to my source code. What I should be able to do is go through the localization process, have another resource bundle created, and it should automatically be able to then delegate at runtime and choose this new, um, this new region and uh, support it in my application. So internationalization just is really, again, just pulling out this hard-coded information and setting up the API methods. One of the key objects that you use when you're internationalizing and actually uh, also used at runtime to decide what locale specific information should be um, displayed is an object called a locale. It's a Java object that represents various types of information for either a user or a machine. The object itself doesn't do too much. It's more or less a label that just says what locale is this uh, user um, interested in having data transferred into. Uh, translated into. And what happens is then at runtime this object is passed around into various helper um, objects and methods uh, that are going to use that object to make decisions about what type of materials should be displayed um, for the uh, actual user. Now when you build a locale you have three different properties that you can potentially use. A language, a country, and a variant. So a language is kind of the, the most obvious of um, our locale settings. In fact, a lot of people, when they think about supporting um, another region, this is all they're really thinking about. They're, they're thinking, I've got my application. Today it's written in English. I've just been told it now has to uh, be, you know, display information in French. And so I need to be able to change the language from English to French dynamically at runtime. So the locale can... Uh, can be configured just to uh, represent a language. You, that's the, the minimum that you would need to create a locale. So when you want to represent the language, we do so using a two-letter ISO standard. It's a ISO 639-1. It's a language code. And some examples, you probably have seen these um, uh, around before. EN for English, DE for German, uh, ES for Spanish. Again, this is a ISO standard, so you can look this up. At the bottom of slide 11, I do have a URL that has the uh, language codes, so you can take a look and see what those are. There is a, a, a newer three-letter standard known as uh, ISO 639-2. Um, for backwards compatibility, it's best to stick with the uh, two-letter standard. Second property that a locale can be configured with is a country. And so a country is initialized with an uppercase two-letter language code, also an ISO standard. This uh, standard is uh, 3166. So some country code examples, US for the United States, CA for Canada, IN for India. And again, on the bottom of slide 12, I have a URL so that you can look up what the different uh, country codes are that are available. The third uh, property of a locale is not used as frequently as the first two, and that's a variant. It's just a way to further differentiate the region uh, or user for specialized displays. Things that you want to do that, um, that you'll use in your application that give you a little bit of more information. It's really an arbitrary string of your choice. There's no ISO standard here. Um, so a variant could be um, a brand that you want to vary. Maybe you're supporting, um, you have a web application and you have different companies that come in and you want to, you know, not only have the right language uh, displayed for the user, but you want to also have the right branding for that user. Well, you could use a variant to um, 
to specify what brand they have. Uh, a common example that you'll find in textbooks about internationalization is those differentiate between a Windows or a Macintosh user using like Win for Windows and Mac for Macintosh. So that's possible as well. Now, when you create the locale, um, you can use these three properties, but there are only a few combinations that are possible. You can create a locale with only the language code. Thinking that's that's perfectly fine. Um, a lot of applications do that. You can also create a locale with a language and a country code. Third is a locale with a language, a country code, and a variant code. Those are your three choices. And as such, that's exactly what constructors are provided for you. So you can create a locale just passing in a string language, passing in a string language and a string country, or passing a string language, a string country, and a string variant. One common bug that I uh, have seen frequently uh, when people are first internationalizing their applications is they may want to try to combine a language in a country and they see it represented as for example uh, English in the United States would be represented as lowercase en underscore capital US and so when they create the object instead of passing in two parameters en and another parameter of US instead what they do is they call the first constructor which takes a single string and they pass in en underscore US that won't work. You won't get the um, you won't get the expected result by doing that. In addition to the constructors, there are some static properties that are available in the Java U2 lo uh, locale class, um, and they're just pre-configured locales that you can use in lieu of creating a locale object yourself. Um, a couple of examples: they have both language and country, so like they have French and France, German and Germany. When we, once we've created our locale object that we're going to use, um, what do we do with it? Well, we don't really do too much with the locale object itself. Again, it's really created to represent a region. It doesn't provide any specific translation or related functionality in it itself. It's what you pass along uh, with by calling a method, and, and uh, it, the method will then you know look and see what the locale object is, and then decide what it needs to do uh, based on that locale object. But it doesn't really delegate to the locale object. It doesn't call things in the locale object necessarily. There's a few um, helper methods and, and properties that are available, but again, typically it's just going to be like a label, like a name tag, so that you can look it up and say, um, what is this? What locale does this user want? Okay, I'll grab that appropriate information. So the actual usage is up to the developers of the libraries you are leveraging. So a couple of uh, typical use case scenarios. Uh, we have a date and the date is formatted for a specific region so we pass a locale object into a date time formatter instead of just displaying a hard-coded date that's in um, a format that people would expect in the United States. Another is a resource bundle is selected um, containing text and images for a specific region based on a locale object. Sorting and searching, this is known as collation, um, is executed in a manner that reflects the rules of a region by configuring a collator with, again, a specific locale object. So now that we know that it's pretty easy to create a locale object and we're able to do that for a user, um, now let's try to figure out what we're going to do with it. What kind of content are we going to pull out of our application and typically then call other API methods to retrieve that information in connection or um, in collaboration with a locale object. So first and obvious is text. Um, again, when people think about globalizing their software, that's one of the first things they think about. My application is written in English. Uh, now I have to display French. What do I? I'm sure I have to pull that text out, and that's that's true. You'll have to pull the text out so that we can uh, choose which languages we want to use. Um, different languages have different sorting and searching rules. Um, Text direction is the text. Should it be displayed left to right like English or right to left like Hebrew? And also word and sentence boundaries. What really defines a word and what defines an end of a sentence? Um, this can uh, be necessary through issues of displaying your text as well as uh, trying to search through and um, using regular expressions and whatnot. In addition to text, you'll want to pull out numbers and currencies. Um, sometimes the actual numbers are different. Excuse me, the characters that represent numbers can be different. Other times, it's just the groupings and delimiters. So, for example, um, in the U.S., we may represent 
the number you see on slide 18 as 481,000 comma 516.23, um, whereas another region may invert that. Where we use a comma, they use a decimal point. Where we use a decimal point, they use a comma. Other uh, regions may omit the first comma altogether and use a space instead. Uh, so groupings and delimiters, and also just the symbols that are used. So um, how percentages are represented, uh, currency symbols, uh, a different symbol for the pound or the yen or the dollar. Um, so different symbols there. And also images. Images are something that uh, people tend to forget about uh, unless there's some actual text in the image. So if there's English text, for example, in my image, that may be a good indicator that I need to um, delegate and use a different image that has text in it with uh, the regional um, uh, specific information. But there's other things that you should uh, also consider. First of all is um, regionally appropriate images. Um, different images and different, even different colors can have very specific meanings to regions and cultures um, depending on what kind of context they're used. So at you know best sometimes that can be confusing to users of other regions. Um, and at worst, it could be insulting. So you need to think about um, different kinds of images and whether or not the images you're using have any specific regional uh, meaning. As far as dates and times are concerned, um, again, we're going to want to pull these out because of the language. There may be regional specific names for a month. Um, the format, sometimes uh, some regions may have in uh, the month listed before the day, some may have the day listed before the month. What kind of delimiter is appropriate? A slash for some regions, a dash for others. There's even different regional calendars. So for example, September 10th, 2009 in a Western Gregorian calendar um, is the equivalent date in a Hebrew calendar of uh, ELUL 21 in the years 5769. So completely different calendars as well. And even other things that people tend to forget about, just what's the first day of the week? In, in America, we assume the first day of the week is Sunday. But in other regions, such as France, the first day of the week is actually Monday. So here is a code example of how we can pull out calendar date and have at runtime have this delegation so that it'll look at a locale and it will then uh, print out what the uh, actual date is um, for that specific region. So in this uh, example I'm just pulling out a locale that's specified when I start up the application and create that locale object. Uh, in this case, as you can tell, I'm only passing in one argument, and since I'm doing that, that means it's just going to be a language code. If I was to pass in a language and country code combined, like en underscore us, um, that locale object wouldn't be configured as I expect. So here I'm just creating a locale object that's going to be based on a language. I use the calendar uh, class that's inside of the Java util package. I get an instance and I pass in the locale and now I've got a localized uh, calendar. Next I'm going to want to do something with the date in terms of how it's formatted. So I create a formatter by using the date format to get a date time instance. I pass in a couple of configuration uh, bits of information. Um, how do I want, how verbose do I want this date and time? Um, so in this case I'm using full which is uh, very verbose, you know, spells out the complete time and the complete dates. And I also pass in my locale. That's going to return to me a formatter that I can use. Um, finally then all I'm doing is printing out using the formatter, passing in the time that's inside of my calendar and I now have a localized um, date. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that working in real life code. All right, so now we're inside of my IDE, and I'm just going to run the same program we just looked at uh, the code for. So here I passed in a locale of French uh, for my language, FR, and you can see below that the uh, date is now f formatted in French. If I wanted to change that, so I'm going to go into my run configurations, and I'm going to change my argument that I pass in from French to be English and I'll run that. Now the same program displays the date and time format in an English 
format. So you can see that my code, really what we've done is a, a classic object-oriented pr principle, which is to separate things that change from the things that stay the same. The act of um, grabbing a date and printing it is going to be the same. What specific uh, information is printed is what's going to be changed. So the code that we've seen here uh, accomplishes that. Okay, another example is our number formatter. So as I mentioned before, there's lots of different things that can happen with numbers. So we can have uh, different groupings, uh, we can have different delimiters. And so all I'm doing here is uh, taking my locale, using the number format class, which is in Java text, and generating a number instance. The parameter that I'm using is uh, whatever my locale is. And then I'm just showing how different numbers can be represented in different regions. So I've got a number that's uh, six digits long for the first one, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then another that uh, includes a decimal point. So let's take a look at this running. Okay, so let's run our number, number format example. Go into my run configurations. And... Let's add the number format example. And I'm going to pass in first English as my locale. So let's take a look at this. Our locale is English. The first number is formatted with a comma uh, in the thousandth place, so one, two, three, comma, four, five, six. And when I have a number with a decimal, it retains that decimal as a decimal point. Uh, let's change this now to be French. And you can see that that's uh, a much different formatting. Instead of using a comma, it uses a space. And then instead of using a decimal, it uses a comma. Again, my code didn't have to be changed uh, depending on the locale. I simply delegated to this number format object, and it took care of it for me. Let's look at another type of, of content that can be internationalized. So in the examples that we were just looking at, we saw that it's pretty easy to remove hard-coded specific data for dates, times, uh, uh, numbers, and whatnot. And we're able to use libraries that were provided to us through the regular Java API that comes standard with the JDK to be able to create those translations, those regional specific displays at runtime. All that we need to do is make sure that we're not hard-coding that data, that we're using these uh, methods, and that we're passing in a locale object um, to, the, to the methods. If we want to do some more work, if we want to have different kinds of translations like uh, swapping of images, swapping of phrases, uh, maybe different objects depending on the region that the user has uh, specified, then what we need to do is uh, create what's known as a resource bundle. So a resource bundle is just a collection of regional specific information. It could be just translations of words and phrases. It could be uh, images. It can be objects. Uh, and resource bundles are something that we create uh, using uh, part of the Java API that's provided for us. So I'll show you how we do this. Um, there are really two different ways that we can create a resource bundle. We can either do this as a Java class or as a property file. And once we create a resource bundle, we'll have it based on a specific region. So I'll have, for example, an English United States region uh, resource bundle or a French Canada uh, resource bundle. So they're separated based on your locale. So when you name the resource bundle, you have to follow a specific convention. First of all, you decide on a base name. And the base name can be whatever you want. Maybe it's uh, login messages or error messages or um, contact us messages. Wh however you want to name the base name. Um, that part is going to be the same for each resource bundle. What's going to end up happening, and I'll show you the rules of selection in a minute, um, once we uh, create our application, we'll just specify the base name of the resource bundles that we want, and then at runtime we'll pass in a locale object so it can grab the very specific resource bundle that we need. So the base name needs to be the same um, for our grouping of resource bundles. After you have the base name, you add some locale information. And it can be any of the three variations that we saw earlier. It could just be the language. It could be the language in the country or language, country, and variant. The delimiter here between base name and the different uh, properties of a locale is the underscore character. 
So let's look at three different kinds of resource bundles that we can create. Um, first, let's look at creating a class. And if I wanted to create a class uh, that had messages and uh, whatnot, I would just simply create a class that extends Java Util Resource Bundle. And when I do that, there are going to be two methods that I'll need to override. I'll need to override the get keys method and the handle get object method. Um, these are declared as abstract methods in uh, Java Util Resource Bundle. So if I do not override these, um, these methods, then I will need to declare that my own class is abstract as well. And sometimes that makes a lot of sense. You may create a um, super class for your resource bundle that all of your other specific resource bundles will extend. And in that case, maybe you just override your get keys method in the abstract class, and each individual uh, class that you create will hand, uh, implement the handle get object. In fact, that's the example that I'll show you coming up here. Um, this is typically used when you need text or objects to come from a data source other than a text file. So if I'm grabbing my text from a database, maybe a web service, really any kind of data store that isn't a pro just a regular property text file. A second uh, type of resource bundle that we'll look at is a property resource bundle. This is the typical implementation that you see. Um, you don't need to override resource bundle. In fact, you don't need to create a special class. Um, you will just uh, create a property file that uses the same resource bundle naming pattern as above, which is you choose a base name and uh, append a locale to it. The only difference is that now it will end with the dot properties extension. And then we'll take a look at a property resource bundle coming up, but it's really just name value pairs, um, just what you'd expect in a property file. And the third type of resource bundle that is common is known as a list resource bundle. And this really can return any type of object you need and is often used for localizing images. So let's start with an example of creating a class that's going to return some strings. So as I mentioned in my particular implementation, what I'm going to do is create an abstract class. Um, and I'm going to call it resource bundle example. And the only purpose of this one is just going to define what keys are available for all of my resource bundles and then uh, override the get keys method. So in this case, I'm creating a string tokenizer with some keys, username, password, and then I override the get keys method, which is expecting to return, return an enumeration object. In this case, I just return that string tokenizer. So again, the resource bundles that I'll create that actually use the keys to look up a specific string um, will not be abstract, but this class will just define the keys for us. So here is a resource bundle that extends the one I just created. Um, in this case, I need to override the handle get object method that will take a key and return an object. So I'm going to inspect the key that comes in. If it's a uh, username, then I'm going to return username in English as my message. If it's password, I'll return password. If it's submit, I'll return submit. So, you know, this is a really simplified example. I'm really more concerned about showing you the format, but you can imagine this does something more uh, meaningful instead of just passing text. Uh, rather, you know, maybe it looks up this information from a database or some sort of delegate that can get it from any kind of data store that we need. Uh, again, in this case, I'm really just trying to show you what methods you need to override and what it needs to return, what the contract is when you're creating a resource bundle class. If I was to implement a solution that, as you're seeing right here, then really I would use what we're going to see uh, coming up uh, that's known as a property resource bundle. So I've, uh, I've overridden this mandle, uh, <laughs> mandle. I've, I've overridden this method called handle get object, and I return this information. You'll notice the name of the resource bundle is my base bundle name, resource bundle example. And it has a underscore and then a part of the locale information, en for English. So I want to create one for French. Same base name, but now I have underscore fr. I override the same method, but this time I uh, look at the key and I return a French phrase for either username or password. Um, for those who speak French, you may notice that this is not necessarily the best uh, translation possible for these uh, terms, username and password, especially in the context of software. I've cheated. I went to Google and uh, used their language tools just to see what the phrase would be. Obviously, um, if this was a commercial enterprise application, we would use a real translation service. Now, once we've created these resource bundles, here's an example of how it would be used. Um, so in my code, I would first uh, you know, create my locale object. 
then I would use the resource bundle class and use a static method on that class called get bundle. I pass in the base bundle name. Notice I'm not passing in any information in that string other than the base bundle name. No underscore en, no underscore um, fr, just the base bundle name, and then passing in the locale. And at runtime, it will look up the, us uh, the strings username and password and print those out. So let's jump back to our real Java code example and uh, pass in some locales. Okay, so here is our resource bundle tester, and what we'll do is we'll create a locale, start with English, pass that in and see what gets printed out, and then we'll create one with French and see what gets passed out. So go to my resource bundle tester, pass in English, and it grabbed the strings username and password as we expect. Change this again. This time we'll pass in fr for French. And there it grabbed our French strings. So as you can see by looking at the code, again, there's no locale specific information here. I don't need to branch my code depending on the logic. That's the process of internationalization. So I just uh, delegate to this resource bundle um, by passing in the base name of the resource bundle and the locale, as well as the keys that I need it to look up. And it will give me the regional specific key uh, text that I want to display. So in the example that I showed you, as I mentioned, what I was mainly concerned with was showing you the contract, uh, the specifics of the actual how those strings were generated, which happened to be hard-coded in the class. Obviously, that's something you probably wouldn't do. You would uh, delegate a lookup um, into some sort of a data store, either through like a delegate object or using a web service. Um, but if I was to just want to like write all the strings out into uh, files, then what I would do is create a property file. And here's an example of that. So what you're seeing on slide 28 is an example of a um, uh, two, two different property files. So I've got my English one and my French property file. And you'll notice we're using the same format, a uh, base name for the resource bundle, and then underscore and our locale. The extension here, though, is dot properties. Otherwise, it's just a regular text file. So in my English one, I have username equals username, password equals password. Um, username equals, in my French, uh, my French term, and password has my other French term. When I want to use this, I don't actually need to create a class to load up the property files or do any management of the property files. Instead, just in my Java code, when I'm ready to actually use uh, the strings and actually do the lookups, that's where I'll put it in. So again, I don't need to extend any specific class or do anything in my Java source code other than getting the resource bundle and looking it up. So it looks very similar to what we just saw with the looking up of a class generated resource bundle. In that, I mean, uh, you use the resource bundle class that's inside of the Java util package, and you use the static method get bundle, which takes uh, two parameters. You're going to pass in the base name of the uh, property file and pass in the locale. So really, this looks exactly like how we were using our class-based uh, resource bundles. It doesn't matter. What's going to happen is it's first going to look up um, to see if there's anything class loaded already. It'll see if there's any classes that you created with this base uh, resource bundle name and locale. And if not, then it will try to find them in the file system as property files. So it looks in both places using the same exact code. So here I just am going to print out that locale and print out username and password. And if I jump back to my code, We'll see this in action. So here's my property file tester. And again, it looks almost identical to my resource bundle tester. We looked at that from before. This one was grabbing our information out of a class. And this one is grabbing it outside of a property file. What's the difference? Nothing. Just It's just going to uh, first look to see if that bundle exists as a class. And if not, it'll look for it at and see if it exists as a property file. So when I run it, it runs pretty much as you would expect. So I'll go to my property file tester. This one I'm going to pass in English. And there you can see it got it outside of the property file. 
Sometimes we need to pass in a little bit more information, maybe a dynamic uh, property um, such as what that username is or what that password is and the placement of that particular parameter that we're going to be submitting may be different depending on which region we're using. So in English maybe I want it to come the username to follow after the username. Maybe in French I want that username to appear um, as the first part of the sentence. So you know there's there's different ordering of uh, words in the context um, depending on the context and depending on the region. So if I want to pass in some dynamic information, I use the format that you're seeing here on slide 30, which is a curly brace format. So my first parameter that I'll pass in will be curly brace 0. Second one will be curly brace 1. Second, uh, third one would be curly brace 2 and so on. So it's a zero indexed parameter and all you have to do is use that curly brace notation. And it'll know at once it does the lookup of that property that it will swap it out at, at runtime. Um, sometimes I want to do a little bit more than just pass in a um, pass in a parameter, I want it to do some formatting as well. And so there are some formatting uh, hints that we can provide uh, depending on what kind of object we supply. So in this case you'll see that my second parameter denoted as curly brace 1 um, is a date and I'm going to want to format it as a uh, long format. We'll take a look at the different kind of formats that are available but just note that this is just a way of passing in an object and then having it do some um, formatting after the fact. So here I've created my English and French um, here are some of the parameters that are possible depending on the kind of object. So if it's a date or time, um, I can use short, medium, long, full, or pattern. If you look below that, you'll see some examples of what that would look like, the different formats in English. Really, what it means to be short, medium, long, or full, that's going to depend on the region, what, what's actually displayed for the date. But it is possible to be from the least verbose to the most verbose. Um, with numbers, there are also formatting parameters such as integer, currency, percent, and pattern. So how do we pass in the parameters once we've defined them inside of our property uh, file? That's pretty easy too. Um, what we're going to use is an object called a message format object that will allow us to uh, pass in those parameters. So here it's, everything starts off as the same as it did before. I'm able to create my locale. I grab a hold of my resource bundle passing in the base bundle name and my locale object. And now I create an array of objects that will be my parameters. So my first parameter is a string JSON. Second one is going to be a date object. You'll notice the type of this array is object, so I'm able to pass in really any kind of um, object I want to. Next I'll use the message format object to actually be, uh, apply this locale, passing the parameters and getting our message uh, to print out as we expect. So you create a new message format object. Um, I'm just configuring it with an empty string. I set my locale. I apply a pattern on it. So I grab my string, the username, and then I format it using that formatter and pass in that object array of params. Once it does that, it will swap out those curly brace 0, curly brace 1, um, with the appropriate uh, information. So let's take a look at some code to see how that looks. Alright, so here's the code that's actually going to create those uh, objects and put them inside of an array and using the message format class to uh, actually format the message after we retrieve the string. So I'll run this first in English. Uh, let's start off with in French. So I pass in the locale French and you can see that it passed in the username first, uh, Jason, and uh, then next it uh, printed out the date in a French format. If I pass in English, you see now that the Jason was placed a little bit uh, farther. First we have the word username and then we put in the parameter JSON and then the date is formatted in an English way. So you can see that it allows us to pass in parameters and also choose their placement and optionally the format of those parameters as well. The third and final type of resource bundle that we're going to look at is known as a list resource bundle. 
uh, a list resource bundle will return really any kind of an object that we want. Um, so when we create a list resource bundle, this is where um, usually you'll store your images that need to be localized or other kind of objects. You need to override one method, and that is the getContents method. And that's going to be a two-dimensional array, and the array looks as you see in our examples here on slide 33. So English, I've got a key and then an actual object. In this case, I'm essentially uh, sw swapping out a flag and a map depending on what region the user is uh, coming from. The key is going to be the same, the country flag, the country map, those will be the same. It's just going to delegate that lookup um, at runtime. So again, it's a two-dimensional array of objects. The uh, first uh, the first parameter will be the, the key, and then the second will be the object itself. The getContents method will simply return that multidimensional array. And then when I want to use it, um, I use a resource bundle, get bundle, as I did before. The only difference now, um, which we didn't have to do when we used the regular classes or the uh, property resource bundles, is that I'll need to cast what is returned to me as a list resource bundle. Um, and once I have that, then I use a method called um, get object. And from there, I can pass in the key and cast it to be whatever object it really was. In this case, it happens to be an image. So the usage of our resource bundles is more or less the same. A little variation with the list resource bundle, but extremely easy after we've created our resource bundles to be able to decide at runtime what content should be selected. So on the topic of selection, how is a resource bundle selected? First what happens is the submitted locale is inspected and a resource bundle with that specific locale is searched for. Now, I should say that um, there, there's often some concerns about performance. If we're using property files, is it going to go looking on the file system and then loading it in and every time we look up a key, go back to the file system, try to find it? No, it's, uh, it doesn't do that. It, it loads it at one time and once it's uh, been loaded, just like a class, it'll be in memory and execute fairly fast. But what happens uh, once that process has taken place is it will uh, look for that particular uh, base name and locale that you've uh, entered and we'll try to find it. If it finds it, great. That's the resource bundle that we'll use. If it doesn't find it, then we'll try to find one with a less specific um, locale. So for example, if the locale object that I passed in contained a variant, then it'll look for uh, a resource bundle with the base name, language, and country. It'll drop the variant. If it still doesn't find something, then it'll try to find something with a base name and just the language that you passed in. And if nothing still, then it's going to look at the default locale of the system. So, so far we've talked about how to create a locale. Um, we need to differentiate now that there's really um, two different places that locales can be stored. And actually, you can store locales in, in many places. But as far as uh, the Java APIs are concerned, it's really looking for two different kinds of locales. The one that you submit into the method, or else the default locale that's already configured for the system. So if the one that we submitted, if the locale object that we submitted um, isn't able to produce anything, just can't find anything with that uh, base name and that uh, particular locale, then what it does is it looks and says, okay, what's the default locale of the system? And it goes through this whole process again. Um, so it will look for the um, if the, the default locale of the system has a language, a country, and a variant, it'll try to find that with the base name. If it can't find that, then it'll find, try to find one with the language and country of the default locale. If that's still not found, drops the country and looks one for the language. If nothing is found after all this is done, um, then it just looks for a simple resource bundle with nothing but the base name. So this is a good uh, best practice that you should uh, that you should uh, uh, take care of when you are internationalizing your application is not only create resource bundles with you know English and French and whatever language and region that you want to support, but also create a resource bundle that's just the base name dot properties. Um, if you're doing a property resource bundle, for example, and the reason is is that if nothing is found it will at least um, it will at least locate that particular resource bundle and display something. Um, if it can't, if nothing is found, then an exception is thrown, and that's a missing resource exception. 
Once the bundle is located, the next thing it's going to do is try to find the key that you submit. And it's going to do, um, you know, basically the same thing that happened with the resource bundles. If it can't find a key in that bundle, then it's going to go into less specific bundles um, to find the key. So again, um, it'll, if it, your bundle contained a variant, it'll try to look for one that, where the variant is dropped. Um, if it still can't find the key, then it'll drop the country and look for another resource bundle. If it's not there, it'll look for the language until you get to that base default um, base name property file with uh, no uh, locale information. So let's see how well you understand um, the, this concept. Got a little quiz here, and we'll go and we'll look at the answers when we're finished. So what you're seeing below are four different property files that I've created. Uh, the base name of the property file is going to be resource bundle quiz. And I have, of the four, I have uh, one that's uh, localized in English, one that's localized in English United States, one that's localized in French, and then a, just a default properties files if it can't find anything else. Um, so that we know which property file is actually displaying the name, we'll, I put a little message next to it so I could see which, uh, which file it's grabbed from. So in the base, it says username equals JSON, parenthetical is base. Um, in French, it's the parenthetical is FR, etc. So what I'm going to describe is what the locale is of the object you're passing in, to the resource bundle, and then what the default locale of the system is, and what key you're trying to uh, locate. So in the, uh, the first question is your locale is French, the default locale is English, and we're looking for a key of password. What is going to be printed when I pass in that key password? Second question, your locale is English. The default locale of your system is French. And again, we're looking for the key password. What string will be printed out when I print out password? Number three, locale is going to be uh, Japanese. And the default locale of the system is French Canada. The key is username. What string will be printed out? Number four. Your locale is French, Canada. The default locale of the system is English, US, and the key is username. What message will be printed out? Number five, our final question. Your locale is English, E-N. Your default locale is French. And the key is state. What's going to be printed out? OK, let's uh, run a program that will run each of these cases and see what our answers are. Okay, so I just made a really simple program that's going to create a locale object as, um, as we saw earlier. I'm creating the locale object for that I'm going to pass in, and I'm also setting the default locale of the system, uh, and then seeing what answer comes back. So let's run this. And I'll expand my console so we can take a look at each answer. Jumping up to the first one, the first one was pretty easy and obvious. So um, I looked up in French and looked for the, the key password. Since it didn't have it, um, it went all the way down to the default base uh, bundle and found my pass. Second one was where my locale was English and the default locale was French. Again, the key was password. And since there wasn't anything in the English um, resource bundle for password. It went all the way down to the default and grabbed my pass as well. Third one is I submitted a locale that wasn't even created, uh, Japanese. So since that wasn't able to be found, it went and looked and found our default locale of the system to be French Canada. And it found a resource bundle that was just French and it was able to find that key username inside of there. 
The fourth was my locale was French Canada. The default locale was English US. And here I passed in username. Again, found it inside of that French resource bundle. The fifth one is probably the one, if you got any wrong, that uh, would have tricked you. And the fifth is, we, you can see it actually threw an exception, a missing resource exception. What happened is that even though there was the key state inside of my English US bundle, it's not, <clears throat> the resource bundle is not going to be, um, it's not going to start looking in more specific resource bundles for it. So really it's going to start with the English resource bundle and if it's not there then it's going to look in um, the default locale and try to find that. Um, even though English is part of English US, um, again that's too specific. It's not going to jump up to English US. My locale would have been needed to be English US to be able to grab that key state. So it really starts at the locale that you submit or the default locale of the system and becomes more general when it starts looking uh, for the specific resource bundle and the key. So moving on from the topic of resource bundles, there's some other things we need to consider when we're uh, going through the internationalization process. And one uh, that's a little more tricky is in terms of collation. So uh, when we're sorting and dealing with uh, searching, how do we do this in a, a regional specific way? What do we have to consider? Well, first of all, there are different regional and language rules in terms of how you'd be able to sort. Um, whether an accent, for example, on a letter should mean that that letter um, is sorted differently if it's at the end of the word or if it's at the middle of the word. Um, there's also multi-character contract, uh, contractions and single-character extractions. And what that means is in some languages I can have, for example, two letters when I write the word in lowercase. But if I write that same word in uppercase, then it becomes one letter. So when I'm doing my searching and my sorting, what does that mean in terms of how it's going to be placed? And the opposite of that is single character extraction. So where I have one character that when it changes case, maybe it becomes two characters. Um, sometimes also uh, you'll see that when you're doing uh, sorting, two characters are really considered to be one character. Um, in Czech, I believe there's a CH, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it's two different letters, but when they appear together, they're sorted um, as if they were one letter. So we use a collator to, to get around this so we don't have to branch our logic in our code. We simply um, use a collator when we want to do our searching sorting. And so the collator strength uh, for the sorting is uh, able to be initialized with a, um, you know, basically how, how strict do you want it to be. And the list from least restrictive to most restrictive is primary, secondary, tertiary, and identical. Now, the default strength is set to tertiary, and what does that mean? Like, how does, you know, how much more strict is tertiary from, say, secondary, or how, you know, you know, uh, least restrictive is primary compared to identical. And it's really going to just depend on the locale, what those specific um, uh, strengths mean. So you just sort of like consider it either you can get, you know, detailed into the language that you're supporting and make sure that, hey, if it's French, then I, you know, want to only support secondary. And if it's uh, German, then I want to do identical. I mean, you can make those decisions as well. You can also just say like, well, I just, I want my collator strength to be identical so it's as strict as possible for every language. But really what that means is going to be dependent on the locale. And doing this really simply, um, here's an example of sorting something using a collator. I use a um, static method to get an instance of the collator, passing in uh, the locale object that I want to use. Once I have that collator, I set the strength. In this case, I'm setting it to its most restrictive, so identical. And then I sort. And to do that, here I'm just using the regular collections.sort. I'm passing in a customer list, but now I'm also passing my collator object. So it can use that and sort it in a locale specific manner. Some other considerations, GUI. We have to think about our interface when we are going to be dealing with an internationalized application. Uh, layout. Different regions are going to expect information to flow in different directions. Um, for example, in Hebrew, uh, this is a language that's written right to left. So sometimes where we expect something to be on the left side, it may make more sense for another region to have that on the right side. 
Um, so you'll want to consider how that layout is affected depending on the locale. Menu items are another thing that may need to flow in a different direction as well depending on how the language is written, especially if like, the language is uh, written from top to bottom instead of left to right, for example. I already mentioned a little bit about localized images. Um, you know, again, if the images contain text, that's probably going to be a real obvious case where you'll want to at least consider swapping it out so that the text is written in the language of the region that you're supporting. Um, and also just the context of the images. As I mentioned, some images and colors do have specific meanings in different regions. And ignoring these issues can cause uh, confusions at you know, best and at worst possibly be insulting. Character expansion and contraction, this is a little different than um, uh, what I was referring to in, in terms of the collator, but it actually can have the same effect. Um, this is more where I have a phrase that maybe in English, let's say it's a four letter or five letter word, and in another language it becomes a 12 letter word. Clearly that's going to take up more real estate on the screen. That may be fine, but maybe you're using a dynamically sized table and that's going to push out your table in a way that maybe you didn't expect. So these are things that you need to think about when you're internationalizing your application. The other thing that you're going to need to do is uh, consider the character set that you're going to be using. Um, I'm just going to give you a real simple rule of thumb. There's other things you can do um, for more specific issues, but in general, what we're going to want to do is move away from the 7 and 8-bit um, ASCII and Latin 1 character sets. Uh, so what is a code set and how does it differ from the encoding? A code set is just a unique code that represents a unique character. It's that simple. So in ASCII, it's a 7-bit code that represents a possible 128 characters. What we typically see in the web on uh, English websites is ISO 8859-1. This is an 8-bit code set, so it represents 256 characters. It's also known as Latin 1. It's also backwards compatible with ASCII. Um, so sometimes uh, people say, hey, this is written in ASCII, and actually the code set that's being used is ISO 8859-1, and that's just because the first 128 characters are exactly the same as the ASCII code set. But what we're going to want to do and in order to support characters and languages that uh, may not be contained in the Latin 1 character set is use Unicode. And Unicode is a 16-bit uh, code set, character set. And as of version 2.0, it's able to contain over 1 million code points. Encoding is a little different than a code set. So when we're transmitting um, our code sets across the wire or through applications, uh, we do it through octets. And uh, the octet can mean something to, to say what, um, what code it represents. So the encoding uh, usually is in two different ways, modal or non-modal. So modal can have escape characters. And what that means is, let's say I'm dealing with a language that has um, some characters are one. Uh, byte. Some characters are three bytes or two bytes. How do I know when I'm reading this if the byte I'm reading is for a single character or if I need to read two bytes for the character? So what they do is in a modal encoding they'll use escape characters. It'll say, hey, everything that follows this escape character is going to be two bytes. Every two bytes is a character. It represents a code point. Um, now it, I'll escape it again and I'll say every character that follows is just one byte. And you just keep doing that, uh, or excuse me, the, you know, the encoding keeps doing that um, so that the uh, language can be translated properly. The uh, non-modal versions are just where you, a set of bytes are specified like this. If the byte falls within you know, such and such range, then it's going to be one byte per character. If it's uh, within you know, another range, then it's going to be two bytes per character. So that's non-modal. Um, the encoding that you typically see for internationalized applications um, is UTF-8. So UTF-8 is the encoding. Unicode is the code set that it's encoding. Um, you're going to need to set this in your servlets and your JSPs for web applications. So a couple of examples of, of looking at that. Um, in my JSP, um, or excuse me, in my servlet, I can use um, the response object, the set character encoding, and I can pass in UTF-8. Otherwise, I can combine it with the content type. Um, I can set that content type to be text slash HTML, semicolon char set equals UTF-8. In my JSPs, I use a directive for the page. The attribute is page encoding, and again, the value would be UTF-8. Now, that's going to be um, 
setting the the encoding of our application when we're using the web and the browser receives the information so it knows how to tra translate that um, what is encoded into a code point, a specific code point for the language, in this case uh, Unicode. Um, there's another kind of encoding that can happen and that's for example the encoding of the actual files that we're saving. So we looked at resource bundles and one of the things we could do were name value pairs uh, in our property files. When you save that, that page has an encoding as well. So I'm going to show you an example here of a um, Japanese file that I created and we'll see what kind of issues that you run into there. All right, so to take a look at the encoding issue that I just uh, mentioned, let's jump back to our property files. And as a quick side note, uh, what you're seeing here is a um, property file that's for the Japanese language. Now, I used Google Translator to look up username and password and get their Japanese strings. If this is wrong, I I apologize in advance, I'm not really sure what it says since I don't actually speak Japanese. Uh, but the, the issue that I want to demonstrate here is what happens when I have a file that's not encoded in 8859-1 uh, encoding and instead is encoded in UTF-8. So my property file here is using these Japanese characters which are definitely not part of the Latin one character set or the ASCII character set. Um, so I save this file as UTF-8 and now when I run my program let's say I pass in a Japanese um, a Japanese locale you would expect that it finds the file but when it tries to read it it's not able to do it it's just it, it reports a missing resource exception for Japanese even though it's clearly there and that's because when the file is read in um, sort of with the resource bundle out of the box functionality um, by default it's going to look for an 8859-1 file and it won't be able to translate the this properly if it's been in UTF-8 so there is a tool that's provided for us um, and this is part of the JDK it's just located in your JDK's bin directory and it's called native to ASCII so what I'm able to do is simply run this what you see here native to ASCII I specify the encoding of the file of that property file and then I specify the name of the file that I want to uh, translate into ASCII and the uh, name of the file I want to change it into so in this case I've got a property file example that's Japanese I just change the extension so it would be a little different um, and then I uh, run this program and it generates property file example underscore j dot properties so if I go and open up what it creates looks like this now sometimes when you look at what it generated you'll actually see some um, escape characters before the first key before username and that's because some editors are going to save uh, some initial bits um, of data that that specify the encoding and sometimes native to ASCII will try to translate that so if you have basically if you have any characters before your first key just delete them you can get rid of it that way but what you're seeing here is now I've got a regular uh, ASCII file um, this is with the characters that are have been encoded um, so that the file can be read and it can be discovered and now if I move this into my package here so I'm going to move this into my resources and uh, I'm going to get rid of that Japanese file that was not working so I'll delete that and yes I'm definitely sure and now I will rename the one I just created We're using native to ASCII so let's just get rid of that new part out of there All right, so now when we run this program again, you'll see that the uh, locale is Japanese. Now it's printing out question marks, and that's only because um, my display here is not configured to display UTF-8 characters in the console, so it's uh, just printing question marks. But if I was to actually use a, um, you know, a web program or, or a regular program, and I specified that the encoding was UTF-8, this would be translated uh, perfectly. Um, so as far as the application is concerned, it works great. In this particular environment, you happen to be seeing question marks, but in a real environment,
environment, that would not be the issue. So you use this native to ASCII tool to um, take UTF-8 characters and translate them into ASCII so that they can be read in by your property file. You'll also do this a lot when you're working with JSPs if you're trying to use some of these uh, uh, double byte and uh, characters that are not found in the uh, ASCII or Latin one character set. You can run the native to ASCII program that will escape them for you and then you can save them in files that are in your regular encoding of 8859-1. So the confusion gets to be here was, well, I thought we have to encode everything in UTF-8. Well, you do. I mean, that's what's actually going to be sent across the wire, and that's what the browsers, for example, and your web applications need to be able to read in. But your own data stores, like when you're saving your own property files, you first create them in regular ASCII 8859-1. Um, they'll be read into the program and translated into uh, Unicode. And once there is Unicode, once we then send it to what the user is going to see, that's the point where it needs to be UTF-8. And that's why we need to specify the encoding in our JSPs and our servlets. So the final part of uh, the presentation on globalizing your Java app is to point you to some third-party tools that are available. So whenever you use third-party, there's you know you have to ask yourself a couple of questions as to why you want to use it. Um, <clears throat> is there it does it provide functionality that you don't uh, have available to you in the regular Java API? Does it perform a little bit better in certain areas? And uh, maybe does it um, is it easier to use? And one particular uh, set of tools that I want to point you to is IBM's ICU for J and the answer to those questions is pretty much yes all across the board. The ICU for J project um, is part of a bigger project. There's actually many different language bindings. Java just happens to be one and there um, the main purpose is that uh, standards are evolving. So the Unicode standards is evolving, the way that we use um, internationalization in our applications is evolving. And if we need to wait for the JDK to be released uh, to support this uh, evolving standards and whatnot, um, we're going to wait quite a long time because JDKs aren't produced all the time um, or very frequently. So IBM, by pulling this out, is able to react to the market in a much faster uh, manner. So as a result, um, by using ICU4j, you're able to take advantage of the latest developments and the most evolved standards um, that are available to us. So take a look at IBM's ICU4j. A lot of the usage is very similar to what we've seen in this um, through the Java API. So um, the learning curve really isn't isn't too bad at all uh, for using ICU4j. A couple other examples I want to point you to. The, the purpose, again, is not to be exhaustive in terms of showing you um, all the different ways that you can implement internationalization, but really just to show you that you know uh, a lot of the tools and frameworks that you're already using do contain some built-in hooks to internationalization. So JSTL, um, the tag library, for example, if you're using those, you can use the uh, format um, uh, library inside of JSTL and they have uh, some tags like set bundle to grab your resource bundles and setting locales, grabbing a message by passing in a key. JSF has its own version as well. Um, their own uh, uh, tags inside of the uh, core and HTML tag libraries, for example. Um, you can use load bundle to grab a particular resource bundle name and use the output text tag uh, using the bundle and the uh, key name that you want to look up. So quite, quite a few different um, ways to do the same thing. Um, the patterns are pretty much the same. It's just that a lot of the different frameworks and tools and uh, will have their own implementation so to make it easier for you to implement internationalization. So that's what you spend the bulk of your time doing when you're creating your uh, globalized application. Um, so what does it mean to localize? As I mentioned, localization, you really, this is the point where we're creating our resource bundles. Um, and so what you're going to work with typically is a translation service that may be internal to your company, it may be external, but somebody is going to be doing this for you. And so what you need to do is you need to grab all of your, your uh, resource bundles that you've created, which uh, will be in whatever your particular region or native language is in, and you'll submit that to that group and say, please you know, do some appropriate translations. What's a really good idea, even if they don't suggest this, is to take screenshots of the areas and give functional descriptions of what the string means and what 
it's going to do that will help them to translate this uh, you know each of the uh, you know, different messages and whatnot appropriately because it's very very possible to have a correct word translation but the word in a particular context may mean something vastly different than you would expect um, for example if you said something like tab to a field um, there may be a language which has uh, you know translate that word field to not mean you know a section of your screen but a field in nature so uh, the context of the word is really important and it may produce a completely different word uh, one that you don't expect um, without having this kind of uh, screenshots with functional descriptions so it's a it's a real good best practice even if they don't request it um, localized testing you're just going to need somebody that really understands the region that understands the language that understands the culture um, so that they can test for correctness and grammar um, they can do cultural considerations to tell you you know this particular image in this particular context um, is offensive or confusing um, and then of course there's uh, the other kind of testing that can be done by pretty much anyone and that's more about uh, how is the GUI looking after this language has been applied um, is there any displacement of the um, you know uh, text fields for example is, is it being uh, after it's been translated are the characters expanding so much that all of the the screen elements are getting squished together that kind of uh, testing can be done pretty much by anybody so a uh, few different books few different resources that I've uh, included you'll notice that a lot of these books are from the earlier part of uh, 2000 and that's because a lot of this hasn't changed a lot of these uh, approaches and libraries and best practices have been fairly stable um, so a lot of these books are still extremely valuable um, if you download the slides um, at the URL that I had at the beginning of this presentation um, you'll have the slide and be able to check out these resources in addition, uh, we also have some courses here at Intertech that are related. Uh, we do teach courses um, both online and in person. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But here are some links to some of our different courses, such as Complete Java, Complete Java Web Development. And we also have uh, some uh, uh, framework classes as well, so Spring Framework, Java Server Faces, and Struts. That's not a complete. Um, description or excuse me a complete listing of all of our courses if you want to take a look at that you can go to the main intertech webpage www.intertech.com and get a complete listing of all of our classes that are available a few more resources that are available we're pretty much connected in every medium that you're used to using so whether it be Facebook Twitter LinkedIn or YouTube we're on there and you can get to those by um, putting in the service name as our host name and then .intertech.com so facebook.intertech.com or twitter.intertech.com linkedin.intertech.com and youtube.intertech.com uh, a couple of blogs as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation I do have a blog that I run uh, decouplednewsings.blogspot.com uh, another Java instructor here Jim White uh, has whitesboard.blogspot.com and again, let's just summarize what we've uh, learned today. We define globalization. And remember, globalization is the um, correlation of a project that has gone through um, local internationalization and localization processes. When you are going to internationalize and localize your pro uh, project, you're going to need to incorporate certain stages into your development life cycle. So that will include an internationalization process, a localization process, and a testing. As far as what internationalization is, we saw that it involves the creation of locales to specify a specific region of a user or a system. Uh, we saw that we need to pull out hard-coded content that's regional specific. We instead then create resource bundles that will um, encapsulate all of the different um, regional specific or localized specific information. We saw the use of a collator for sorting and keeping in mind the GUI considerations, things that can go wrong as uh, characters are expanded and contracted. We looked at character encoding and remember that it's important that once the uh, application, especially in a web environment, is uh, being viewed in a browser, that at that point it needs to be in UTF-8 and so you need to specify the encoding in your servlet or your JSP as being UTF-8. However, the property files that you're creating need to be ISO 8859-1 um, so when you do that you'll want to use the native to ASCII tool to escape those characters that would otherwise have to be saved as UTF-8. 
little confusing, but again, on the server side, you want to save it and escape it. And, uh, and on the uh, uh, client side, you want to have everything represented as Unicode through the UTF-8 encoding. Pointed you to the ICU4J uh, project and third-party tools, and also just kind of showed you that you know a lot of the frameworks that you're already using, whether it be JSTL or JSF, um, are going to contain some really nice hooks for you to be able to do internationalization as well. And localization. That's um, more or less the handoff point where we give this to someone who's able to do the translations. It's our job as developers to um, make, our, make the translations as easy as possible. So by giving screenshots with functional descriptions and linking them to the keys in our resource bundles, that will greatly help um, the translation company to give uh, not only uh, correct in terms of the word translations, but also in terms of the context of those words, and also to go through that testing uh, process. So here at Intertech, as I mentioned, we have lots of different kinds of content that's available. Um, you're looking at one right now, a free Oxygen Blast seminar. We give these periodically, um, several several times a year. And the Oxygen Blast is it's free. You can do it online. You can do it live at our offices. We also have uh, podcasts through iTunes, YouTube videos. Maybe you're watching this right now through a YouTube video. Uh, we have white papers, PDFs, etc. Lots and lots of different resources. And the best way to stay on top of the resources is to sign up to our newsletter. If you go to our homepage at intertech.com, you can register for the newsletter at the bottom of the home page and uh, be notified when this uh, material, new materials posted through these various mediums. In addition to the free resources that we uh, generate, we also have two services that we offer, uh, training and consulting. So on the training side, which was uh, founded in 1991, we offer classes in uh, Java, uh, everything from the basic to intro to Java to more advanced topics in Java, including frameworks such as Spring, uh, Struts, JSF, all their open source technologies. We also teach .NET, um, so uh, everything from basic .NET, uh, ASP to C Sharp, uh, WPF. We have SQL cl uh, classes in SQL Server, SharePoint, and web technologies such as XML and AJAX. There's a few different ways that you can take classes with us and have training. We have instructor-led um, public classes that are on-site in Egan, Minnesota. Um, so we've got some really great classrooms that we have available with great uh, facilities uh, for teaching these, this material. Uh, we also have virtual classes and uh, classes that are led at nighttime as well. So lots of different scheduling options and different ways that you can take it, whether you're in person or online. Also, we have a delivery format of self-paced study. Um, and you can find out more information about that by going to our website or um, to find out about our Elite Rewards program um, for advanced purchases. You can call the phone number you see on slide 60 here, 651-994-8558, uh, extension 23. So that's the training side. The other side of Intertech is consulting. And we have um, lots of different offerings for the consultant. So we have um, everything from the design to the developer role all the way over to the architect. Um, our brand is really instructors who consult, consultants who teach. So um, there's a lot of swapping of roles that happen in our organization. All of our classes are taught with uh, people who have been in the real world and continue to be in the real world. And then we also have our consultants who take their real world experiences and, and teach um, uh, seminars and whatnot at Intertech. Um, so if you had any more information about our consulting offerings, you can call 651-994. 8558 extension 11. So that concludes this Oxygen Blast on globalizing your Java application. Hope you found this informative. And again, if you need any other information about Intertech, please uh, go to http://www.intertech.com. Thanks for joining me.